start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and I think you're going to thank you this program. I'm very sad I didn't join you before today. But uh, I'm looking forward to today and tomorrow and to have uh, engaging discussions with you. And particularly, I'm very, very happy because I'm, I'm invited to speak about a topic that is very dear to my heart. Um, I'll be talking about public engagement with science. And um, I was very happy the previous speakers were mentioning Denmark because I'm from Denmark. That's a very, very less okay. That's a very, very um, small country of northern Europe. And uh, it's part of Scandinavia. And we Scandinavians, yes, that sounds better. <laughs> Good. Um, I hope, should I start all over again by saying I'm very happy I've been invited and talk about such a thing. I'm very, 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 it's very dear to my heart. But I was in the middle of talking about coming from Denmark, this very small country up in the north of Europe. I was very happy the previous uh, speaker talked about Denmark and this uh, new UNESCO site in Denmark, which is about um, integrating problem-based learning in engineering studies at the university. And actually, that was a really good start for me, because I think some of what I was be speaking about is differences in national cultures. And those of you who've gone abroad, um, or I, mean, I know a lot of you are already abroad when you're here, but those of you who've gone to other continents might have found yourself in a situation where you're just thinking, I really don't understand what's going on here. And um, that happens to all of us. It happened to me yesterday when I landed, very confused. I was very happy that I was taken very good care of, picked up at the airport and taken here. So I felt very, um, I felt very good looked after. And, but uh, the reason why I say that is because I might be saying things today that you think sounds utterly strange and unfamiliar. And I hope that if you want to, you're actually very welcome to raise your hand in the lecture and ask me what I mean. But if you don't sort of want to interrupt me, which I might have a suspicion that you don't want to do, and that's quite all right, then please at least ask me questions either afterwards in the question session or maybe find me afterwards outside. And just ask me to explain what I really meant by this. Because, and I'm actually not saying this to be nice and just because I'm a professor and I'm inviting you to engage with what I'm saying. I'm also saying this because I stand to learn a lot from your questions. Just like the previous speaker was saying, she was very happy about being asked this question about UNESCO and what it was. I think that that goes for me as well. I actually learn when people ask me things. And uh, I'm working in a university because I like to learn. So that goes for students, but I think it also goes for most of the faculty that we need. That we're, the reason why we're still at universities is because we're curious about things. We want to know how they are. And I guess that's the starting point of this discussion, or this talk, I'm going to try to explain why it is that it's necessary to talk about public engagement of science. I'm going to talk about how, how can it be that that has come up as a solution, and what's the problem if that's a solution. But I just want to start by saying that one of the reasons why it's important is that Science is not some free-floating balloon or spaceship that sort of floats around the globe and then lands in universities and does itself and then it can just take off and go somewhere else. Science is a societal activity and it's very, very deeply interlinked with society. So the way we sometimes talk about science as one thing and society as another is actually, it's wrong because it makes us think that it's two different things. And, but I might say it sometimes simply because we've gotten used to use the language in that way. But try to sort of understand, I mean, this is extremely important also nowadays because society faces lots of challenges and they can only be solved through science. And therefore it's, not, it's no use if science is just sitting somewhere doing things on its own. It actually has to be integrated with society so that one, it can learn about societal challenges and problems and actually actively help to solve it. But also so that these solutions aren't being made in one room and then once they're ready and done and sort of packaged neatly as a solution, then scientists go out into society and say, here's a solution to your problem. And then maybe people sort of in society says, that's not the solution we wanted. 
that's a major problem that that's happened. It's happened mostly in Europe so far, but also in other places. Um, and actually, I predict that that's going to happen more and more if scientists aren't better at integrating into society sort of during the process of making solutions. So basically, that's what I'm going to talk about. And, and I hope you can already see that now it's sort of a mixture of both making science more effective in making it better at delivering solutions, but it's actually also got a very deep democratic element. Science is a societal activity, and therefore society, society pays for science, and society sort of is at the receiving ends of both the solutions that's created and the problems that sometimes appear as well. So of course, therefore, science has to be integrated in making decisions about society as well. Right, so that's enough of an introduction. I'm going to sort of just give you an overview of what it is that I'll be talking about. I'll try to just talk about uh, sort of why we talk about public engagement in the first place. Why has this come up as something that it's necessary to talk about? And very often, uh, I'm a social scientist, very often we social scientists and humanities scholars who is interested in this, um, that's this when it says I have a PhD in science and technology studies, I don't actually, I didn't study science and technology, I studied sort of science and technology as, as a thing that goes on in society, so I'm a social scientist. Um, but we very often we talk about the new governance of science, that is the new way that we try to steer and govern and maybe not control, but at least sort of try to make regulations for science. So let's, I'll just say a little bit about that first. Then I'll talk a little bit about Denmark and where I come from and why it is that Denmark is a specific case and, and a very particular place to study public engagement with science. Then I'll try to give you two examples. I know I said I was only going to talk about one, but I thought that was a little bit too little. So I'll talk about two different examples just to sort of explain or give you an examples of what it is that I'm talking about. And then I'll sort of draw it in together. But let me say, I'm not going to give you a recipe for how to do public engagement with science. To me, one of the best things about public engagement with science is that it's something you have to invent as you go along. It's, you can't just, there is no one solution that works everywhere, right? hence my talk about the differences of culture. There is no solution that works everywhere. It's something that we have to, in each context, in each nation, in each... Um, uh, region, we have to find out how is it that science should, that we scientists should engage with the public in the area that we are. So that's what I'll be sort of explaining that. Right, so that's it. Now we're ready to go and now I will sort of start again with this. I'll do this sort of introduction and theory. I'll try to make it as sort of light as I can, but some of it might be slightly abstract, but then I hope that when I get to the examples you might see why this is. So just to give you, I said before that in Europe uh, we talk about this new governance of science, meaning that there is a new way that we talk about the regulation of science, which has to do with its relationship to society. And I just found two sort of very important quotes from very important actors in this field. One is from the European Commission, and it's uh, sort of ten years old, which I know to you must seem like ancient, but for me it's almost like that was just yesterday. But but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of, it, it was a good quote because it marked the, the beginning of what was called the Science and Society Action Plan. And the, what they said about that was that that was to be the beginning of a long process, the objective of which is to change the relationship between science and society. So you can see kind of, there is this kind of thing about this, that it's supposed to be a really major change, and it is about how science relates to society. And I have another quote that's uh, from uh, the House of Lords, have a select committee on science and technology, uh, and that's in Britain. Britain is important because besides Denmark, Britain has done a lot of stuff in public engagement uh, over the last 10, 15 years, and there's some specific reasons for this. I won't go into them now, but we can talk about them if you're interested. But, um, but the House of Lords is actually also very important because in, two, in, in 19... 85, they gave out a report that was called the Public Understanding of Science. And that was actually a really, really good report. It talked about how it was necessary for scientists to realize that it didn't do that they were just doing science. They had to make sure that people outside of science and the rest of society actually understood what they were doing. 
Uh, and so it spoke a lot about the necessity for scientists to take this challenge seriously and to actually go out and engage. I must say it was read by people like me, not necessarily me, but social scientists read it and were very critical of it. And we'll come back to it. But actually, if we go back and look at it, it was a really good report that had some very good. Then later on, because of all this criticism and a lot of discussion, they actually made a new report in 2000 where they talked about sort of science in society. And one of the things that they recommended was that we sort of started, instead of just talking about un making public understand the science and educate the public to understand, they said it's necessary that we think of this as a two-way process. So science needs to learn about society and the public as well as the public needs to learn about science. So therefore they say we recommend now that direct dialogue, that dialogue as in we talk together, both of us say so, both sides sort of engage, that we move to direct dialogue with the public and it, that, that that should move from being an add-on to science-based, from, yeah, sorry. It should move from being an, add, an, an optional, so something you can choose whether you want to do or not, an add-on, so something you just stick on in the end to science-based uh, policy making it should become a normal and integral part of the process of both policy making and of sort of science making as well. And what they say in this quote is that rather than think of science communication and public understanding of science as something we do every now and then when we have the time, which by the way we never have. So rather than think of it as something we do sort of every now and then or in the end when we've done the science, we have to move this engagement and discussion communication right into the actual process of making science. So while we're doing science and technology, we need to talk to people outside about what it is that we're doing. Because otherwise, they won't have any chance of actually engaging properly with what it is that we're doing. So just to give you a little bit, why, why did they, why now I've sort of talked to you about what was the most important tenets in this new governance of science, but if, if we sort of, if I want, if I'm going to broader, paint a broader picture, these are the things that I can kind of sort of use to explain why this came about. One of them is that, that in Europe, there's, there had been, at this point in 2000, there had been an experience of a lot of controversy over science. Maybe one of you, uh, maybe you will be familiar with the controversy over genetic in, uh, uh, GMO, uh, genetic modified organisms, um, because in middle of the 90s, the Europeans suddenly, sort of all over Europe, there were public uprise and uh, criticism of uh, genetically modified organisms as uh, used in food. And the reason that, well, a lot of scientists saw this criticism and this controversy and said that's because the public doesn't understand about genetically modified organisms. There were some surveys that said that most of the European population didn't know that there were genes in non-GMO uh, tomatoes. So scientists used this sort of to say, well, the public doesn't even know that there's genes and everything, so how can they be allowed to have a voice about the use of, of GMOs in food. The thing about that is that actually what people weren't skeptical of wasn't maybe not so much the technology in itself, but the way it was being used. The fact that it was big corporations who owned the intellectual property rights of these uh, new technologies that controlled them, that used them to generate huge um, uh, uh, surpluses and, and sort of to control, particularly in the third world, the way people were farming and stuff like that. So actually this criticism over GMO wasn't necessarily just about not understanding, it was also about the social values behind this. But anyway, one of the reasons, I mean, the GMO controversy wasn't the only one, there's been controversies over stem cell research as well, in, in, and sort of human, lots of technologies for human reproduction as well have been sort of quite controversial. In Britain, there was a big scandal about the, uh, the yeah, Kreuzfeldt's disease, the mad cow disease, as it was known, where science advisors and politicians kept saying that there was no danger, we could just eat this beef because it was scientifically proven that it wasn't d uh, dangerous. And then in the end, it turned out that actually that wasn't true, that it was dangerous, that you could get this disease. And of course, all these experiences sort of really uh, uh, challenged the trust in science and the, um, and the belief that science was just sort of 
well, at least publics were skeptical. Maybe science isn't so great as we are sort of told to think. So all these controversies led policymakers and scientists to start thinking differently, that we needed a new kind of, uh, of governing of science. There was also a lot of the critique of the deficit theory. The deficit theory is this idea that when people are skeptical towards science, it's because they don't know. Um, what social scientists and others pointed out was exactly what I did before, that the skepticism and the critique of science didn't just come from uh, from lack of knowledge. It also came from deeply held values and beliefs about who should own knowledge and who should make money on what kinds of knowledge at some other people's expense. So, um, so therefore, if you want to understand the critique of, of science and technology, we have to dig deeper and to understand that. It's not just because of a deficit of knowledge. And then generally in Europe there is these very big discussions about democracy, participation. We talk a lot about how we engage the ordinary citizens of Europe in the general ruling of the region and the countries. So of course, since science is a big thing, in, in, um, it's a big part of our national budget, we also need to think about how citizens and, and society can have an impact on what that budget is used for. And then finally, uh, or second last, is also that at the same time, of course, as these democratic issues come up, there's also this strong sense in Europe, like in the rest of the world, that we need to become a globally competitive uh, economy, that we need to, um, to be better at making new in uh, innovations, and that that's what we're going to be sort of living from in the future. And of course, if we want that, then if we have a lot of criticism and sort of uh, resistance against new technologies, then that can actually serve as some kind of roadblock, something that will block our ability to become um, a competitive nation. So these are some of the overall issues that go into this debate. Um, now I will be sort of a little bit more specific. Because in this discussion about this, this, the need for this new governance of science, Denmark came up as an example of where things were done differently. And it is true that there has been a participatory uh, um, uh, flavor of the, Danish, the whole Danish po political system. And that, of course, has also had an influence in the, the way we govern science. And, um, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, and I put this little creature, the image of the, the little mermaid, um, which is she's sitting in a Danish uh, Copenhagen harbor, and uh, I put this up because sometimes when people outside talk about Denmark, it's almost like it's this fairy tale country where we're just talking about science and technology and we reach a, an, an agreement about how we how we're doing. And this is almost the way the, the House of Lords people, when they sort of were writing their report, they thought about Denmark. Um, and it's not to say that that isn't true at all, it's just to say there's a lot more to that story, of course. Um, but what the House of Lords saw was that here was a, a culture where there was actually some institutions that were sort of functioning as a safeguard to the public that science and technology couldn't just sort of run wild or develop into something that wasn't societal ex acceptable or, or wanted. Um, and let me just sort of, what, what is that thing? And, um, and I think I, I thought a lot about how I should sort of phrase this. But what I, want, but what I, I decided on was to say, it's really in Denmark, there is a very, very widespread anti-authoritarian critique of modern technology. So people, and what do I mean by that? By anti-authoritarian, I mean that people are very naturally very skeptical towards authorities. And when authorities come and say, hey, we're going to have this new technology, people will say, hmm, we don't know if that's a good idea. It, it's the authorities who say it's a good idea, so that probably means that it is a bad idea. So there is this sort of mm, almost um, built into people skepticism towards elite knowledge. Um, the ordinary man, as I've said, the sort of normal and ordinary citizen is actually is, is supposed, is thought about to have some very important input into the political uh, process. So what we can say is that in Denmark actually citizens are taken very, very seriously as the foundation for the political process. 
If citizens say that, that something is a bad political decision, then policymakers won't just be able to say, oh, but we disagree and we know best. In Denmark, you can't say we know best. You have to explain why something is a good uh, idea. Um, yeah, there's a, a joint commitment to what you could call a shared culture. Denmark is a very small uh, country. It's been very, very homogenous until recently. Uh, basically, the sort of the Danish culture is um, yeah, very self-sustained, uh, um, and then it has a very we have a very big tradition of reaching consensus. If we disagree about something, then there is an implicit understanding that we need to talk about it in order to find a comprom uh, find a, a compromise or a consensus where we sort of both where we all agree where we can sort of agree that this is a good solution for all of us. So it's not okay in Denmark for someone to just say, oh, but uh, I'm the bigger and or the wiser or the smarter, or oh, I have more money, so I decide what you should think is good. Quite on the contrary, you can't use those arguments. You have to sort of explain why something is good for them. So, um, so on this note, of course, science and technology in Denmark has to come under the same scrutiny as all the other things we decide in society. How should we pay for hospitals? What should the tax be? You know, how should we educate kids in schools? What should the military be? How much money do we want to give to the to the national theater? All these things, science come in, and all these as as things that we discuss in the same way. Right. So, having given you that sort of general background, now I'm going to move to something that might be uh, easier to just get some pictures on because there's sort of two specific examples of. How is this then done? Why do, how do we actually do public engagement in Denmark? And I'm going to talk to you about two different things. The first is the Participatory Consensus Conference, which is a format that's been pioneered by what's called the Danish Board of Technology. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, it's an important format. It's, it's a way of making conferences where you can talk about political decisions that's spread out to many places in the rest of the world. And then I'll talk about a debate installation that I have made myself with uh, the help of uh, my team and some artists, uh, which was also a way of engaging people in sort of participatory uh, engagement, well, participatory discussion about science. So a way to not just demonstrate what science is to people, but actually engage people and talk about what is science and how should it be regulated. But let's do the consensus conference first. The consensus conference is a format that is used when there is a political issue where there's sort of disagreement about. And the idea is that if we sit down in a room at a conference, we might and get a lot of people together with different perspectives, we might actually be able to find out what's a good solution to this problem. So, and the very important point about this, this, this participatory consensus conference on science and technology is that it includes citizens and experts. And actually, citizens are the most important ones. And this is the kind of key, crucial element. So there's two panels, a panel of citizens and a panel of experts. And the citizens are sort of the first panel that you make. And you find 16 citizens that are sort of um, balanced in terms of age and gender and education level. So you have both people who have gone to university, but also people who have no university education. And then you balance, and then you sort of start by talking to the citizens about this problem. For instance, genetically modified organisms. So, and then you start by having a talk to the citizens. So what do you think is the problem about this? How should we regulate it? How should we use it in society? And then the citizens formulate these questions sort of what would they like to know more about in order to make their minds up of how this is a good uh, thing for uh, society. And then uh, the organizers will start inviting experts into the expert panel. And the experts are then experts because they can, they're sort of the, the right experts to answer the questions that the citizens ask. So um, in the end, you then have a panel of citizens and a panel of experts. And then you have the conference and you invite an audience and typically we've had like large audiences of maybe 100, 200, 300 people listening to uh, what goes on as well. And then on the first uh, day and a half, um, experts will give that, they've been sort of briefed beforehand on the, the questions that the citizens would like answering. 
And then the, the experts give a sort of uh, a statement, they, they try to answer the questions, and then afterwards the citizens can ask more questions of the experts, so they can sort of dive into particular issues that they want more answers to. And the audience can also ask a bit of questions. And in this way, there's a dialogue that involves between the citizens asking the questions and the experts trying to answer them. Then after this one and a half day, then the citizens go away for themselves, and then they sit and deliberate, they talk among each other, and, and try to get to reach an agreement. That's why it's called a consensus conference. They try to reach a consensus on how they think this technology should be used and regulated in society. And then they write a consensus document, and then everyone comes back again to the same room sort of on, after on the next days, and then this consensus document is presented. And then the experts are allowed to comment on the document, but they can't say, oh, you got it wrong. You say it you know, shouldn't be used, but it really should. Because it's the citizens that decide what goes in this document. And then when it's presented, there will be a, a, a sort of selection of politicians who will come and listen to this presentation as well. And the idea is that then this consensus document can be taken further into Parliament and then used by, um, by, the, by, the, by the politicians to make decisions about how this particular technology or science should be regulated. But as I say, the important, the really, really important thing about this format is that experts testify and they give their statements but they ha don't actually have any say in the consensus statement. They can't decide what goes into the final consensus document. Whereas it's the citizens who believe to have this perspective of the common good to be able to say what's best for society as a whole. And what you can see is that it's the experts as it are, they're, they're, they're thought of to have a lot of knowledge that's important, but they're in some way also thought of to be kind of biased, not sort of particularly biased for their own personal benefit, but biased in favor of science and technology. So therefore, it's said it's important that it's citizens who actually make the decision about how they should be used in society. And just to give you an idea about what could the topics be for this, I mentioned uh, GMOs, which you could see we had a, a, a conference only in 1999, but there's been lots of other uh, topics uh, that uh, has um, been on that there's been sort of has been subject of, uh, of one of these consensus conferences. Sadly, there hasn't been one within the last eight years, and that's because it's extremely expensive to have these consensus conferences, and uh, there has been a change in priorities in the government, so that they haven't been funded over the last years. Uh, but hopefully, um, it will come again. And the interesting thing that it's actually happened in lots of other countries, people have adopted this format and made their own consensus conferences. And this is from a website uh, called the LOCA Institute, and you can look it up if you're interested. You can see there's a long list of, uh, of, of countries that have experimented with this uh, format. And there's also, there's been two in Korea and two in Japan. So if you're interested, go to that and look at that. Um, right. The other example I wanted to give you is quite different. Um, it's what I call, ended up calling a debate installation. It started out as a kind of a science communication activity uh, because I have always been studying public understanding of science and what I've been saying is it's important to have a dialogue and to sort of have both sides engage and to sort of contribute to this communication. And I found out that when I was talking about my own science and to the public, I very often ended up doing exactly like I'm doing now. I would stand and speak and people, now you, would sit there and listen. And then mysteriously we would think that when I was speaking, my words will go into the microphone, out of the speakers, and in your ears, and into your brain, and then do something in there. And uh, there's a lot of communication research that demonstrates that that's actually not the case at all. That we learn very little from just listening to someone else speak. We learn a lot more and we understand a lot more if we engage in a two-way uh, dialogue, if we talk to each other, and even more if we experiment and, and so on. Let's not go into that. But anyway, this was the reason why I thought it's really too bad that I always talk about dialogue and never do it myself. So I gathered, I teamed up with uh, some artists and, um, 
and some other people, and uh, we made first one installation, which is too complicated to try to explain how it was, but it was a very big thing. But then we did another one, uh, and there's a picture over there. And as you can see, it was never intended to be photographed from the top, because you can see that the top of this installation doesn't really look very pretty. But, uh, you know, things develop and it happens so that it was uh, put up. This is a picture from an exhibition of this installation in a shopping center outside Copenhagen. And, um, and the idea was, I said to make it, that I'll tell you a little bit more about what was in this installation, but just to give you a sense of what was it supposed to do. Uh, it was supposed to make communicate, science communication. So basically the content, this installation is telling people stuff from my research. So it's telling me that it's telling people the results of my research, um, but it's supposed to do it in a way that engages people, um, where they can sort of talk back, so to say. It's also supposed to uh, communicate to senses rather than just the brain, the cognitive influences. So it's supposed to sort of let people experience something rather than just tell them what's going on. Um, it's uh, supposed to talk about research-based problems rather than just what I call ready-made facts. And the reason for that is that I wanted to get into dialogue with people through this. And I know myself well enough to know that once I've made the project and I've done the report and here's the result and it looks like this, then I don't really want people to come and say, oh, but actually, you know what, why didn't you do this instead and you could have done that and you could maybe learn more if you go this way. Because by then I'm sort of done with it. Whereas when it's during the process of the research, if you're sort of talking to people about what you I'm sure you have experienced this. If you're talking to people about what you're doing while you're doing it, you're much more sort of open in terms of learning new things. Whereas when you've finally made your assignment, handed it in, you learn from your teacher's comments, but, but you're sort of, you're kind of already, your brain is onto the next project. So the idea is that if you want to communicate to the public, really we need to do that while the research is ongoing, not to do it afterwards. And the same goes for why it has to be integrated in the research. If you remember in the beginning, the House of Lords, they were saying that instead of doing science communication as an add-on, we should do it as an integrated part of research. This was also the idea with this installation. And finally, uh, it should make the audiences able to react in a way that they thought was relevant. So people should be sort of able to go in here, learn something, and then to react to react back in a way that they thought they wanted to. So how do we do this? We did. I mean, each of these boxes that you can see are an element in themselves, uh, and they're sort of different types of elements. And I'll just go through a couple of them. One of the elements were that we were asking people questions. So we simply Sort of, it could almost be understood as a, as a kind of a, a, a three-dimensional survey or questionnaire. So on your left uh, is a question where we're asking people who they think should be in control, who they think should be part of regulating science. So who should decide what science should be done? And the, uh, you can see that the, the categories there are researchers, politicians, business, and citizens. And then people answer by switching a night switch. So if they turn it to green, it means that the people should be part of deciding. And if it's on red, it means that people shouldn't be part of deciding. So the person who's been in here last obviously thought that researchers should be deciding and that citizens, that's the fourth one, should be deciding, but that politicians and business shouldn't be part of deciding what science is done. And then we added a couple of places where people could put in their own categories. So someone here has written children and then switched it to red. So the point here is that children shouldn't be part of regulating science. And at other points, you know, there are lots of different suggestions here. But the idea is that if you, have, I, if you do a questionnaire, I always have this experience that the answer I want to give is never really a possibility to cross. So I want extra categories so that I can put in my own answer. This is kind of what we wanted to do. And then um, uh, the other picture shows a different question, which was about sort of what kind of future uh, does society, does science and technology bring? And then people were supposed to answer in a different way there. 
Yeah, it was that it always it had to be physical. You had to do something to mark your answer. And then after people had done this, they were supposed to vote. We had these little voting beads, so they could put in these, there's some plastic cylinders where they put these voting beads in, so that slowly the installation itself would look different uh, in terms of who, um, who uh, well, depending on what the people who'd already been in there thought about science and technology and the regulation, then the installation would gradually begin to look differently because you could, for instance, see that a lot of people would have voted that uh, business shouldn't be part of deciding. Actually, that was a very strong outcome of this installation was that almost everyone who went in there said no to business playing a part in regulating science. So a different way that people could engage was that there were sort of different uh, types of stories in there and then they, people could write their own comments in these squares. You can see there's uh, a man writing an argument, a, a comment there, and I've got a picture of one of the squares. So then you could see, of course, when you came in afterwards, you could see what people had written before, a little bit like what you have out here on the wall, on the comments on the lectures. Uh, but you could also, there were some uh, pads so that you could cover, if you thought a comment was done, you could sort of cover it up so that no one else could see it. And then of course the next people could go and take the pad away, so it was kind of like there was a game going there in terms of what kind of comments should be visible. And then finally, um, we had this, we wanted to give people knowledge, uh, given that it was an effort to communicate science. But we also wanted to say that we wanted to sort of at the same time let people experience that knowledge is not necessarily something that's just readily available, that sometimes you have to really work in order to get to know something. Um, and of course that was a bit hard to do, but what we did was we, we, we hid away the stories that we told in these little chambers and then people had to look through these periscopes in order to see what it said so that uh, a man there, sort of, you had to sort of move the periscope away uh, around in order to read what it said on the inside. So the idea there was that you know that you actually have to you have to do something yourself. Knowledge isn't just presented to you. You also have to sort of work at it yourself in order to get to know um, what you want to know. And then the final element I'm going to talk about is we had these reflection boxes. I just got something in my eye. That's why I'm doing this perspective. We, we had these reflection boxes where people could go in and where the idea was that because a lot of the other stuff that happened happened in the social room where everyone was sort of around each other. We wanted to give people uh, the sort of sense of what happens if I go on my own, to change my mind if I'm on my own and not around people. And one of the things we did was we made this room where we called a look into the future. And uh, that's this yellow box and when people went in there there was uh, two mir uh, mirrors on each side, and on the right-hand side were lots of hope pictures, and on the left-hand side were lots of fear pictures. And the hope and fear, I mean hope were images like flowers and happiness and children and good things, you know, being well and cured and fed and things like that. So lots of symbolism to symbolize that. And the images were put on the mirror so that they were transparent, but you could sort of see them still. And the fear pictures were sort of very um, war, uh, destruction, nuclear power plants, because they have a certain symbolic function in Denmark. They even had that before uh, the tragedy in Japan and we have no nuclear power, so that was a good symbol. Lots of symbols, weapons and lots of things like that. That was the kind of fear pictures. And yeah, and then the light changed in there. So when you were in there, every 10 seconds the light would change, so that sometimes the light would be on you, so you would see your, your own reflection in the mirrors most clearly, and sometimes the light was on the images, so that you would see the images most clearly. And of course the idea was to make people reflect about what is it that I think is the future that will come out of science and technology. And then when they came out, they were supposed to write little notes on what they'd experienced on these red and green notes. Uh, so hopes on green notes and fears on red notes and then hang them up so that other people could see what they've written. How am I doing for time? So, um, just to, what, what was this installation actually supposed to tell people? Um, the idea was that we would want people to experience then technology and research science, technology research, 
are shaped in social processes. It actually matters what people in society think about this. Uh, because, for instance, it matters because it's the politicians that sort of generate, that give resources to science. So if there's support, then you can get more resources. If there's lack of support, then you get less resources. If you have more resources, the likelihood that you find new cures and discover new inventions are bigger than if you have few resources. So the idea is to make people think about the fact that science and technology happens in society. It's a social process and it actually matters what people think and what they think is legitimate, what they think we want to give the social to. And we also wanted to show that people can participate if they want to. You, you're, there's a whole debate sort of unfolding in front of you, but you can be part of it. And if you choose to take part, you also shape the way it looks for the next people who come in. And so if you participate in, public, in the public debate, for instance, if you write a, a contribution to the a letter to the editor, for instance, there's limits on how long you can make it. And it was the same here. So there's lots of ways in which you're limited in, in what you can say at this, and which sort of fitted this. But also the point is that when you participate, you actually shape the way this landscape of debate look for the next people to come. So concludingly, I've now given you two very different examples of, of public engagement with science. One example is the format that's used for when you have, you have to make a political decision about science and technology, and it's a format that allows you to integrate uh, citizens into this, um, uh, into this <coughs> policy making process. The other is an example of how you can actually think about public engagement when you do science communication. How can you invite people to be part of this discussion about what science is and what it should be? And I think that the most important thing is that when we talk about this public engagement, it's important to keep this duality, uh, keep this double uh, perspective open. Because science communication and public engagement it is both about securing democracy and legitimacy. Science is a social activity, and it has to be legitimate and a part of society just like everything else. So it's both about that, but it's also about securing the acceptance of new science and technology. Uh, I haven't talked a lot about that, but I think that it's really important to think that if we have proper discussion, say for instance that the, genetic, that the whole issue of genetically modified foods had been tackled differently by the big global corporations. Say that they'd listened more to people before they sort of made their solutions and put them on the market. They might not have made solutions that would have created such a lot of criticism. Maybe they could actually have made something that people thought was a good idea instead of, I think the problem was that they were a bit er too arrogant in that they thought that they could just on their own deliver the solutions that society wants. The point is that we need to talk to society in order to find out what's actually wanted. So when we try to understand public reactions to these engagement processes, it's extremely important to think that um, the public reactions come out of deep values and concerns about what is a good society. They're not just sort of harsh reactions because we don't understand. They might be, but, not, but far from all of them are. And it's important that we understand what these values are and where these reactions and where the concerns come from so that we can integrate them into the scientific process. Because if we do that, it's actually possible to use it as a resource for making better solutions. So instead of thinking, instead of scientists just thinking that they can make the solutions on their own, if they go out and ask and you know, talk to people in society, for instance, if you're doing healthcare solutions, make sure that you know what the patients think as well. Because if you do that, you probably stand a good chance to make better solutions than if you just think about what the patient's problems are without ever asking them. And then I want to say sort of something that I, that I started with and which is kind of implicit in a lot of what I've said. If we do public engagement, we have to do it with a very large amount of respect to the national culture and tradition in which it's supposed to fit into. So I'm sure that, uh, like, um, yeah, my students would never call me professor, or they wouldn't use my last name. They would all call me my, my first name. 
and it's seen as extremely pretentious and weird if I, I mean, I couldn't insist that they should use my last name. When I come out here, I think that you would find me a bit odd if I just sort of said that, no, no, you can't use my last name. So I think that, or, or you shouldn't call me professor. It's, it, I mean, that's on a very basic level. But the idea is that we have to understand what people think is normal and where is it that their values come from. So when, so when we try to engage publics with science, we can't just, now I just told you how the, the consensus conferences has been exported throughout the world, but there's been quite a lot of changes to the format, which the local organizers have done in order to make it fit, because we can't just do a consensus conference in Korea or Japan or Australia or Argentina, Brazil, or even the US, or even in England. We can't just do a, con a consensus conference there like we're doing them in Denmark. We have to think about what is it that people expect as well. But no matter how we do it, we have to think it, it as a two-way process. So if you take nothing else from what I've said, I want you to take that you have to engage, that science communication has to be a two-way process. Scientists know about science but citizens know about what kind of society they want to live in. And that's the kind of society that your science and technology has been working. So you need to talk to the citizens about together finding out what's the best solution to make the best society. So thank you very much.